Recording by Marianne. The Countess Rostova were sitting in the drawing room. The Count had taken the men into his cabinet and was showing them his favorite collection of Turkish pipes. Occasionally he would go out and ask, Hasn't she come yet? They were waiting for Maria Dmitrievna Akrosimova, called in society La Terrible Dragon, a lady who was distinguished not for her wealth or her titles, but for the honesty of her character and her frank, simple ways. The imperial family knew her, all Moscow knew her, and all Petersburg, and both cities, while they laughed at her on the sly and related anecdotes of her brusque manners, nevertheless, without exception, respected and feared her. The conversation in the cabinet, which was full of smoke, turned on the war which had just been declared through a manifesto in regard to the recruiting. No one had, as yet, read the manifesto, but all were aware of its appearance. The Count was sitting on a low ottoman between two of his friends, who were talking and smoking. He himself did not smoke and did not talk, but, inclining his head now to one side, now to the other, he looked with manifest satisfaction at those who did, and listened to the conversation of his two friends, whom he had already set by the ears. One of the men was a civilian, with a wrinkled, sallow, lean and cleanly shaven face. Though he was approaching old age, he was dressed in the height of style, like a young man. He was sitting with his feet on the ottoman, like a man thoroughly at home, and holding the amber mouthpiece at one side of his mouth, was sucking strenuously at the smoke, and frowning over the effort. This was the old bachelor, Shinshin, the countess's own cousin, a venomous tongue, as it was said of him in Moscow drawing-rooms. He talked as though it were an act of condescension toward his opponent. The other, a fresh, ruddy young officer of the guard, irreproachably belted, buttoned, and barbered, held the mouthpiece in the middle of his mouth, and gently sucked the smoke through his rosy lips, sending it out in rings from his handsome mouth. This was Lieutenant Berg, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, with whom Boris was going to the army, the very person about whom Natasha had teased Viera by calling him her lover. The Count was sitting between these two and listening attentively. The occupation that the Count enjoyed most, next to the game of Boston, of which he was very fond, was that of listener, especially when he had a chance to get two good talkers on the opposite sides of an argument. "'Well now, Batyushka, my most honourable Alfonso Kerlich, said Shinshin, with a sneer, and, as his custom was when he talked, mixing up the most colloquial Russian expressions with the most refined French idioms, your idea is to make money out of the state. You expect to get a nice little income from your company, do you? Not at all, Pyotr Nikolaitch. I only wish to prove that the advantages of serving in the cavalry are far less than in the infantry. You can now imagine my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. Berg always spoke very accurately, calmly, and politely. His conversation invariably had himself as its central point. He always preserved a discreet silence when people were talking about anything that did not directly concern himself, and he could sit that way silently for hours, without feeling or causing others to feel the slightest sense of awkwardness. But as soon as the conversation touched any subject in which he was personally interested, he would begin to talk at length, and with evident satisfaction. Consider my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. If I were in the cavalry, I should not receive more than two hundred a quarter, even with the rank of lieutenant. But now I get two hundred and thirty, said he, with a pleasant, joyful smile, glancing at Shinshin and the Count, as though it were plain for him that his success would always be an object of interest to everybody else. Moreover, Pyotr Nikolaitch, continued Berg, by being transferred to the guard, I am in sight. Vacancies in the infantry occur far more often. Then, you can see for yourself, on two hundred and thirty roubles a quarter, how well I can live. I can lay up some, and send some to my father, too, he went on to say, puffing out a spiral of smoke. That's where the difference lies. A German can grind corn on the butt of his hatchet, as the proverb puts it, said Shinshin, shifting the mouthpiece of his pipe to the other side of his mouth and winking at the Count. The Count laughed heartily. 
the other guests seeing that shinshin was engaged in a lively conversation crowded round to listen berg remarking neither the quizzical nor indifferent looks of the others proceeded to explain how by his transfer to the guard he would attain rank before his comrades of the corpus how in time of war the company commanders were apt to be killed and he if left the senior in the company might very easily become a captain and how everybody in the regiment liked him and how proud of him his papenka was berg evidently took great delight in telling all this and he never seemed to suspect that other people had also their interests but all that he said was so suavely serious the naivete of his youthful egotism was so palpable that he quite disarmed his auditors well my lad whether you are in the infantry or in the guard you will get on that i can predict said shinshin tapping him on the shoulder and setting his feet down from the ottoman berg smiled with self-satisfaction the count followed by his guests passed into the drawing-room it was the time just before dinner is announced when the assembled guests in expectation of being summoned to partake of the zakuska are disinclined to entering any detailed conversation and at the same time feel that it is incumbent upon them to stir about and say something in order to show that they are in no haste to sit down the host and hostess keep watching the dining door and exchange glances from time to time the guests try to read in those glances for whom or for what they are waiting some belated influential connection or for some dish that is not done in time pierre came in just before the dinner hour and awkwardly sat down in the first chair that he saw right in the middle of the drawing-room so that he was in everybody's way the countess tried to engage him in conversation but he merely answered her questions in monosyllables and kept looking naively around him through his spectacles as though in search of some one it was exceedingly annoying but he was the only person who did not notice it the majority of the guests knowing about his adventure with the bear looked curiously at this big tall quiet-looking man and found it difficult to believe that such a burly unassuming creature could have played such a trick on a police officer have you only just come asked the countess oui madame replied he glancing around you have not seen my husband no madame and he smiled at absolutely the wrong time you were in paris lately i believe i think it is very interesting very interesting the countess exchanged glances with anna mikhailovna who perceived that she was wanted to take charge of this young man she took a seat by his side and began to talk to him about his father but he answered her just as he had the countess merely in monosyllables the other guests were all engaged in little groups le razumonsky that was charming you are very good la comtesse apricasine were the broken phrases that were heard on all sides the countess got up and went into the hall is that you marya dmitrievna rang her voice through the hall my own self was the answer in a harsh voice and immediately after marya dmitrievna entered the room all the young ladies and even the married women except those who were aged rose marya dmitrievna paused in the doorway she was tall and erect fifty years old and wore her gray hair in ringlets under the pretext of turning back and adjusting the wide sleeves of her dress she took a deliberate survey of all the guests marya dmitrievna always spoke in russian congratulations to the dear ones said she in her loud deep voice which drowned all other sounds well you old sinner how are you she said addressing the count who kissed her hand i suppose you are bored to death in moscow eh no chance to let out the dogs well what's to be done batyushka when you have these birds already grown up she waved her hand toward the young ladies whether you wish it or no you've got to find husbands for them well my cossack said she marya dmitrievna always called natasha the cossack smoothing natasha's hair as she came running up to kiss her hand gaily and without any fear i know that this little girl is a madcap but i am fond of her all the same 
she took out of a monstrous reticule a pair of pear-shaped amethyst earrings and gave them to the blushing natasha in honor of her name-day then she turned immediately upon pierre he he my dear come here right here she cried in a pretended gentle voice come here my dear fellow and she threateningly pulled her sleeve still higher pierre went to her ingenuously looking at her through his spectacles come here come my dear fellow i have been the only one who dared tell your father the whole truth when he required it and now i shall do the same in your case it's god's will she paused all held their breath waiting for what was to come and feeling that this was but the prologue he's a fine lad i must say a fine lad his father lying on his deathbed and this young man amuses himself by tying a policeman on a bear's back for shame batyushka for shame you would better have gone to the war she turned away from him and gave her hand to the count who found it difficult to keep from laughing outright well then to dinner it is ready i believe said marya dmitrievna the count led the way with marya dmitrievna followed by the countess escorted by the colonel of hussars a man to be made much of since nikolai was to join his regiment anna mikhailovna went in with shinshin berg gave his arm to viera the smiling julie karagina went with nikolai to the table behind them followed the rest of the couples making a long line through the hall and the rear was brought up by the tutors and governesses each leading one of the children the waiters bustled about chairs were noisily pushed back an orchestra was playing in the gallery and the guests took their places the sounds of the count's private band were soon drowned in the clatter of knives and forks the voices of the guests and the hurrying steps of the waiters at the head of the table sat the countess marya dmitrievna at her right anna mikhailovna at her left then the other ladies at the other end of the table sat the count with the colonel of hussars at his left and shinshin and the other men at his right at one side of the long table were the young gentlemen and ladies fiera next to berg pierre and boris together all facing the children and their guardians on the other side the count through the long line of decanters and vases with fruits looked across to his wife and her towering headdress with its blue ribbons and zealously helped his neighbors to wine not forgetting himself the countess also not neglecting the duties of a hostess cast significant glances at her husband over the tops of the pineapples and it seemed to her that his bald forehead and face were all the more conspicuously rubicund from the contrast of his grey hair on the ladies side there was an unceasing buzz of conversation on the side of the men the voices grew louder and louder and loudest of all talked the colonel of hussars who ate and drank all that he could his face growing more and more flushed so that the count felt called upon to hold him up to the other guests as an example berg with an affectionate smile was talking with viera on the theme of love being not an earthly but a heavenly feeling boris was enlightening his new friend pierre as to the guests who were at the table and occasionally exchanged glances with natasha who was seated on the opposite side Pierre himself said little, but he ate much, while he scanned the faces of the guests. Having been offered two kinds of soups, he had chosen turtle, and from the fish kulabyaka to the sauté of woodcock he did not refuse a single dish, or any of the wines which the butler offered him, thrusting the bottle mysteriously wrapped in a white napkin over his neighbor's shoulder, murmuring, dry Madeira, or Hungarian, or Rhine wine, he held up the first that he had happened to lay his hand upon of the four wine glasses engraved with the count's arms that stood before each guest and drank rapturously and the face that he turned upon the guests grew constantly more and more friendly natasha sitting opposite gazed at boris as young girls of thirteen only can on the lad with whom they have just exchanged kisses and are very much in love occasionally she let her eyes rest on pierre and this glance of the ridiculous little maiden so lively in all her ways almost made him feel like laughing he could not tell why nikolai was seated at some distance from sonya and next to julie karagina and was again talking with her with the same involuntary smile sonya also had a smile on her lips but it was not natural and she was evidently tortured with jealousy 
first she turned pale then red and was trying with all her might to imagine what nikolai and julie were talking about the governess was looking around nervously as though ready to make resistance should any one presume to injure her young charges the german tutor was endeavouring to fix in his memory all the different courses desserts and wines so as to give a full description of it when he wrote home to germany he felt sorely grieved because the butler who had the bottle wrapped in the napkin passed him by he frowned and tried to make it appear that he had no wish to taste that wine and was only affronted because no one was willing to see that he needed the wine not for allaying his thirst or from greediness but from motives of mere curiosity End of chapter 16 At the men's end of the table, the conversation was growing more and more animated. The colonel was telling that the manifesto, in regard to the declaration of war, had already appeared in Petersburg, and that he had seen a copy of it, which had been brought that day by a courier to the commander-in-chief. "'Why the deuce should it behoove us to fight with Bonaparte?' exclaimed Shinshin. "'He has already made Austria talk very mild.' I fear that now it will be our turn. The colonel was a stout, tall German of sanguine temperament, but a thorough soldier and a patriot, nevertheless. He felt affronted at what Shin Shin said. But why, my dear sir, said he, mispronouncing every word, inasmuch as the emperor knows that. In his manifest, he says that he cannot look with indifference on the dangers threatening Russia, and that the safety of the empire and the sanctity of the allies and he put special emphasis on the word allies as though it contained the whole essence of the matter and then with his infallible memory trained by official life he began to repeat the introductory clause of the manifesto and as the emperor's wish and constant unalterable aim is to establish peace in europe on lasting foundations he has determined to move a portion of his army across the frontier and make every effort for the attainment of this design and that is the reason my dear sir said he in conclusion edifyingly draining his glass of wine and glancing at the count for encouragement do you know the proverb yurima yurima you'd better stay at home and twirl the spindle said shinshin frowning and smiling that fits us to a t even surov was cut all to pieces and where shall we find a surov nowadays what do you think about it asked he incessantly changing from russian to french we must fight the last drop of our blood said the colonel thumping on the table we must be willing to perish for our emperor and then all will be well and argue as little as possible as little as possible he repeated giving a strong stress to the word possible and looking again at the count that's the way the old hussars look at it and how do you look at it young man and young hussar he added turning to nikolai who quite neglecting his fair companion now that the talk turned on the war was looking with all his eyes at the colonel and drinking in all that he had to say i agree with you entirely returned nikolai in a glow and turning his plate round and rearranging his wine glasses with a resolute and desperate face as though at that very instant he were going to be called upon to face a great peril. "'I am convinced that we Russians must either conquer or die,' said he, and then instantly felt just as the rest did, after the words were out of his mouth, that he had spoken more enthusiastically and bombastically than the occasion warranted, and had, therefore, been guilty of a solecism. "'What you just said was splendid,' said Julie, with a sigh. Sonya was all of a tremble, and blushed to her ears and even to her shoulders, while Nikolai was speaking. Pierre listened to the colonel's speeches, and nodded his head in approval. "'Here, that's splendid,' said he. "'You're a real hussar, young man,' cried the colonel, again thumping on the table. "'What are you making such a noise about there?' suddenly spoke up Marya Dmitrievna, her deep voice ringing across the table." why are you pounding on the table she demanded of the hussar what are you getting so heated about pray one would really think that the french were right here before you i am telling the truth said the hussar smiling always talking about the war cried the count across the table you see i have a son who is going Marya dmitrievna 
My son is going. Well, I have four sons in the army, but I don't mourn over it. God's will rules all. You may die at home lying on your oven, or God may bring you safe out of battle, rang Maria Dmitrievna's loud voice without any effort from the further end of the table. That is so. And the conversation was again confined among the ladies at their end of the table and among the men at theirs. You won't dare to ask it, said Natasha's little brother to her. I tell you, you won't dare. Yes, I will too, replied Natasha. Her face suddenly kindled and expressed a desperate and mischievous resolution. She started up with a glance, causing Pierre, who was sitting opposite to her, to listen, and addressing her mother. Mamma, rang her childish chest voice across the table. What is it you wish? asked the countess, alarmed, but seeing by her daughter's face that it was some prank, she shook her finger sternly at her and shook her head warningly. There was a lull in the conversation. Mamma, what sort of pastry is coming? cried the little voice, even more clearly and without any hesitation. The countess tried to look severe, but could not. Maria Dmitrievna shook her stout finger at the little girl. Cossack, said she. The majority of the guests looked at the old ladies and did not know what to make of this freak. You will see what I shall do to you, said the countess. Mamma, tell me what pastry we are going to have, cried Natasha again, all in a giggle, and assured in her own merry little heart that her prank would not be taken amiss. Sonya and the stout little Petya were struggling with suppressed laughter. There, I did ask, whispered Natasha to her little brother and to Pierre, on whom she again fastened her eyes. Ices, but you are not to have any, said Marya Dmitrievna. Natasha saw that there was nothing to be afraid of, and therefore she had no fear of Marya Dmitrievna. Marya Dmitrievna, what kind of ices? I don't like ice cream. Carrot. No, what kind? Marya Dmitrievna, tell me what kind? she almost screamed. Maria Dmitrievna and the countess laughed, and the rest of the guests did the same. All laughed, not so much at Maria Dmitrievna's repartee, as at the incomprehensible bravery and cleverness of the little girl who could and dared treat Maria Dmitrievna so. Natasha was made to hold her tongue only when she was told that they were to have pineapple sherbet. Before the ices were brought, champagne was handed around. Again the orchestra played, the Count exchanged kisses with his little Countess, and the guests standing drank a health to the hostess, clinking their glasses across the table with the Count, with the children, and with each other. Again the waiters bustled about, there was the noise of moving chairs, and in the same order, but with more flushed faces, the guests returned to the drawing-room and to the Count's cabinet. End of chapter 17 The card tables were brought out, Partners were selected, and the Count's guests scattered through the two drawing-rooms, the divan room, and the library. The Count, having arranged his cards in a fan-shape, found it difficult to keep from indulging in his usual after-dinner nap, and laughed heartily at everything. The young people, at the Countess's instigation, gathered around the clavichord and the harp. Julie, first, by general request, played a piece with variations on the harp, and then she joined with the rest of the girls in urging Natasha and Nikolai, whose musical talent was known to all, to sing something. Natasha was evidently very much flattered by this request, and at the same time it filled her with trepidation. "'What shall we sing?' she asked. "'The fountain?' suggested Nikolai. "'Well, give me the music, quick. "'Boris, come here,' said Natasha. "'But where is Sonya?' She looked around, and seeing that her cousin was nowhere in the room, she started to find her. She ran into Sonya's room, and not finding her there, hastened to the nursery, but she was not there. Natasha then came to the conclusion that Sonya might be in the corridor on the great chest. The great chest in the corridor was the place of mourning for all the young women of the house of Rostov. There, in fact, Sonya was found, in her airy pink frock, all crumpled, lying flat on her face on a dirty striped pillow that belonged to the nurse, and, hiding her face in her hands, was crying as though her heart would break, while her poor, bare shoulders shook under her sobs. Natasha's face, which had been so radiant all through her name-day, 
suddenly changed. Her eyes grew fixed, then her throat contracted, and the corners of her mouth drew down. Sonya, what is the matter? Tell me what it is. What is the matter with you? Oh, oh. And Natasha, opening her large mouth and becoming perfectly ugly, cried like a child, without knowing any reason for it, except that Sonya was crying. Sonya tried to lift up her head, tried to answer, but found it impossible, and hid her face again. Natasha sat down on the blue cushion, and threw her arms around her dear cousin. At length Sonya put forth an effort, sat up, and began to wipe away her tears, saying, "'Nikolenka is going away in a week. His papers have come. He himself told me so. But I should not have wept.' She held out a little piece of paper which she had been reading. It contained the verses which Nikolai had written for her. I should not have wept for that. But you cannot understand. No one can understand. What a noble heart he has. And once more her tears began to flow at the thought of what a noble heart he had. You are happy. I do not envy you. I love you and Boris, too, she said, composing herself by an effort. He is good. For you there are no obstacles. But Nikolai is my cousin. We should have to. The archbishop himself. Else it would be impossible. And that if Mamenka, Sonya always regarded the countess as her mother and called her so, she will say that I am spoiling Nikolai's career, that I am heartless and ungrateful, and she would be right, too. But God is my witness. Here she crossed herself. I love her so and all of you, except only Viera. And why is it? What have I done to her? I am so grateful to you that I would gladly make any sacrifice for you. But it's no use. Sonya could say no more, and again she buried her face in the cushion and her hands. Natasha tried to calm her, but it could be seen by her face that she understood all the depth of Sonya's woe. Sonya, she exclaimed, suddenly, as though surmising the actual reason of her cousin's grief. Truly, didn't Viera say something to you after dinner? Tell me. Nikolai wrote these verses himself, and I copied off some other ones, and she found them on my table, and said that she was going to show them to Mamenka, and she said, too, that I was ungrateful, that Mamenka would never let him marry me, and that he was going to marry Julie. You saw how he was with her all the time, Natasha, why should it be so? And again she began to sob, more bitterly than before. Natasha tried to lift her up, threw her arms around her, and smiling through her tears, began to console her. Sonya, don't you believe her, dear heart? Don't believe her. Don't you remember we three and Nikolenka talked together in the divan room after lunch? Why we thought it all out, how it should be. I don't exactly remember how it was, but you know it will be all right, and everything can be arranged. There was Uncle Shinshin's brother married his own cousin, and we are only second cousins, and Boris said that that was perfectly possible. You know I tell him everything, for he is so very clever and so kind, said Natasha. Now, Sonya, don't cry any more, dear dove, sweetheart, Sonya and she kissed her and laughed merrily. Viera is spiteful. I'm sorry for her. But all will be well, and she won't say anything to Mamenka. Nikolenka himself will tell her. And then again, he doesn't care anything about Julie. And she kissed her on her hair. Sonya jumped up, and again the kitten became lively. Its eyes danced, and it was ready, waving its tail, to spring down on its soft little paws and to play with the ball again, as was perfectly natural for it to do. "'Do you think so? Truly? Do you swear it?' said she quickly, smoothing her crumpled dress and hair. "'Truly, I swear it,' replied Natasha, tucking an unruly tuft of curly hair back under her cousin's braid. "'Well, now, let us go and sing the fountain. Come on. But do you know, that stout Pierre who sat opposite me is so amusing.' suddenly exclaimed Natasha, stopping short. Oh, it is such fun! And the girl danced along the corridor. Sonya, shaking off some down, 
and hiding the verses in her bosom, her face all aglow, followed Natasha with light, merry steps along the corridor into the divan room. According to the request of the guests, the young people sang the quartet, entitled The Fountain, which was universally acceptable. Then Nikolai sang a new song which he had just learned. The night is bright, the moon is sinking. How sweet it is to tell one's heart that someone in the world is thinking, My own true only love thou art. That she, her lovely hand, is laying upon the golden harp to-night, while passionate harmonies are swaying her soul and thine to new delight. One day, two days, then paradise. Alas, thy love on her deathbed lies. He had hardly finished singing the last word, when preparations began to be made for dancing, and the musicians made their way into the gallery with a tramping of feet and coughing. Pierre was sitting in the drawing-room with Shinshin, who, knowing that he had recently returned from abroad, was trying to induce a political conversation that was exceedingly tedious to the young man. Several others had joined the group. When the music struck up, Natasha went into the drawing-room, and going straight up to Pierre, said, laughing and blushing, "'Mama told me to ask you to join the dancers.' "'I'm afraid of spoiling the figures,' said Pierre. "'But if you will act as my teacher,' and he offered his big arm to the dainty damsel, though he was obliged to put it down very low. While the couples were getting their places, and the musicians were tuning up, Pierre sat down with his little lady. Natasha was perfectly delighted. She was going to dance with a big man who had just come from abroad. She sat out in front of everybody, and talked with him, exactly as though she were grown up. In her hand she had a fan which some lady had given her to hold, and with all the self-possession of an accomplished lady of the world, God knows when and where she had learned it, she talked with her cavalier, flirting her fan and smiling behind it. "'Well, well! Do look at her! Do look at her!' said the Countess, as she passed through the ballroom and caught sight of Natasha. The girl reddened and laughed. "'Now what is it, Mamma? What would you like? What is there extraordinary about me?' In the midst of the third, Ecouzes, the chairs in the drawing-room, where the Count and Maria Dmitrievna were playing cards, were moved back, and a large number of the distinguished guests and the older people, stretching their cramped limbs after long sitting, and putting their portemonnaies and wallets into their pockets, came into the ballroom. First of all came the Count and Maria Dmitrievna, both with radiant faces. The Count with farcical politeness, as though in ballet fashion, offered the lady his bended arm. Then he straightened himself, and his face lighted with a peculiarly shrewd and youthful smile, and as soon as the last figure of the Ecouzes was danced through, he clapped his hands at the musicians and called out to the first violin, Semyon, do you know Daniel Cooper? This was the Count's favorite dance, which he had danced when he was a young man. More particularly, it was one of the figures of the Anglaise. Look at Papa! cried Natasha, loud enough to be heard all over the ballroom. She forgot entirely that she was dancing with a grown-up man. She bent her curly head over her knees, and let her merry laugh ring out unchecked. Indeed, all who were in the hall gazed with a smile of pleasure at the jolly man standing with the dignified Marya Dmitrievna, who was considerably taller than her partner, holding his arms in a bow, straightening his shoulders, and turning out his toes, slightly beating time with his foot while a beaming smile spread more and more over his round face, and gave the spectators an inkling of what was to follow. As soon as the merry, fascinating sounds of Daniel Cooper were heard, reminding one of the national dance, the trepaca, all the doors of the ballroom were suddenly filled, on one side by the serving men belonging to the household, on the other with the women, all with smiling faces coming to look at their merry-hearted baron. Ah! "'Our little father, an eagle!' exclaimed an old nurse, in a loud staccato, in one of the doors. The Count danced well, and he knew it, but his partner had absolutely no wish or ability to dance well. Her pretentious form was erect, her big hands hung down by her side. She had handed her reticule to the Countess. Only her stern but handsome face danced. 
what was expressed in the whole rotund person of the count was expressed in marya dmitrievna merely in her ever more and more radiantly smiling face and loftier lifted nose but while the count growing ever more and more lively captivated the spectators by the unexpectedness of his graceful capers and the light gambols of his lissom legs marya dmitrievna by the slightest animation on her part by the motion of her shoulders or the bending of her arms in turning about or beating time produced the greatest impression for the very reason that every one always felt a certain awe before her dignity of bearing and habitual severity the dance grew livelier and livelier the other dancers could not for an instant attract attention to themselves and did not even try all eyes were fastened on the count and marya dmitrievna natasha kept pulling at the sleeves and dresses of all who were near her to make them look at her papenka but even without this reminder they would have found it hard to take their eyes off the two dancers the count in the intervals of the dance made desperate efforts to get his breath waved his hands and cried to the musicians to play faster quicker quicker and ever quicker lighter lighter and even more lightly gambled the count now on his toes now on his heels pirouetting around marya dmitrievna and at last having conducted the lady to her place he made one last paw lifting his fat leg up from behind in a magnificent scrape and bowing his perspiring head low at the same time with a smiling face sweeping his arm round amid rapturous applause and laughter especially on the part of natasha both of the dancers paused breathing heavily and wiping their heated faces with cambric handkerchiefs that's the way we used to dance in our time mon cher said the count good for daniel cooper exclaimed marya dmitrievna drawing a long breath and tucking back her sleeves End of chapter eighteen at the very time when in the rostov's ballroom they were dancing the sixth anglaise and the musicians from weariness were beginning to play out of tune and the tired servants and cooks were preparing for the supper count bezukhoi received his sixth stroke of apoplexy the doctors declared that there was not the slightest hope of his rallying from it the form of confession and communion was administered to the dying man and preparations were making for extreme unction while the mansion was filled with the bustle and expectation usual in such circumstances outside the house around the doors hidden by the throngs of carriages gathered the undertakers hoping to reap a rich harvest from the count's obsequies the military governor of moscow who had been assiduous in sending his adjutant to inquire for the count this evening came himself to bid farewell to the famous grandee of catherine's time the magnificent reception room was crowded all stood deferentially when the governor who had been closeted for half an hour with the sick man came out slightly bowing in reply to the salutations and endeavoring to pass as rapidly as possible by the doctors priests and relatives who fixed their eyes upon him prince vasili grown a trifle thinner and paler under the strain accompanied the military governor and was repeating something in an undertone having seen the distinguished caller to the door prince vasili sat down alone in the hall threw one leg over the other resting his elbow on his knee and covering his eyes with his hand having sat that way for some little time he got up and with hasty irregular steps looking around with startled eyes he passed through the long corridor that led to the rear portion of the house to the room occupied by the oldest of the three princesses the visitors in the dimly lighted reception room talked among themselves in low whispers and relapsed into silence looking with eyes full of curiosity or expectation when the door that led to the death chamber opened to let any one pass in or out the limit of his life said a little old man a priest to a lady sitting near him and listening earnestly the limit is fixed he will not live beyond it it seems to me it is late for extreme unction is it not asked the lady adding the name of the priest she affected to be unenlightened on this point it is a great mystery gentle lady replied the priest passing his hand over his bald forehead on which still lay a few carefully brushed locks of grayish hair who is that the governor of moscow someone asked at the other end of the room what a young-looking man 
but he's seventy years old they say don't they that the count doesn't recognize any one any longer are they going to give him extreme unction all i know is he's had seven strokes the second niece just came out of the sick chamber with weeping eyes and sat down by dr lorraine who had assumed a graceful position under the portrait of the empress catherine and sat with his elbow resting on the table beautiful weather princess and this being in moscow is like being in the country said the doctor in french it is indeed said the princess with a sigh can he have a drink lorraine pondered a moment has he taken his medicine yes take a glass of boiled water and add a pinch he indicated with his slender fingers what he meant by a pinch of cream of tartar i never heard of a case where a man survived more than a third stroke said a german doctor to an adjutant what a constitution the man must have had said the adjutant and who will get all his wealth he added in a whisper some one will be found to take it replied the german with a smile again they all looked at the door it opened to let the young princess pass with the drink which lorraine had suggested for the sick man the german doctor went over to lorraine do you think he will last till tomorrow morning he asked in atrocious french lorraine thrust out his lips and made a motion of severe negation with his fingers in front of his nose to-night at latest said he in a low voice with a slight smile of self-satisfaction at being able to understand and express the state of his patient then he went out meantime prince vasily had opened the door to the princess's apartment it was almost dark in the room two little lamps were burning before the holy pictures and there was a pleasant odor of incense and flowers the whole room was furnished with small articles of furniture chiffoniers cabinets and little tables behind a screen could be seen the white curtain of a high post bedstead a little dog came running out and barking ah is it you mon cousin she got up and smoothed her hair which as always was so extraordinarily smooth that one would have thought it made of one piece with her head and then covered with varnish what is it what has happened she asked you startled me so nothing there is no change i only came to have a talk with you katish about business said the prince wearily sitting down in the chair from which she had just risen how warm you are here he exclaimed however sit down there let us talk i thought something must have happened said the princess and she took a seat in front of him with her face hard and stony as usual and prepared to hear what he had to say i was trying to get a nap mon cousin and i could not well my dear said prince vasily taking the princess's hand and doubling it over in a way peculiar to himself it was evident that this well my dear referred to a number of things which though unspoken were understood by both of them the princess with her long thin waist so disproportionate to the rest of her body looked at the prince full in the face from her prominent gray eyes then she shook her head and with a sigh glanced at the holy pictures this action might have been taken as an expression of grief and resignation or as an expression of weariness and hope of a speedy respite prince vasily explained this action as an expression of weariness that's the way with me said he do you suppose it's any easier for me i am as played out as a post-horse but still i must have a talk with you katish and a very serious one prince vasily became silent and his cheeks began to twitch nervously first on one side then on the other giving his face an unpleasant look such as it never had when he was in company his eyes also were different from usual at one moment they gleamed impudently malicious at the next a sort of fear lurked in them the princess holding the little dog in her dry thin hands in her lap scrutinized the prince sharply but it was plain to see that she did not intend to break the silence by asking any question even though she sat till morning do you not see my dear princess and cousin katerina sebyanovna continued prince vasily evidently bringing himself not without an inward struggle to attack the subject at such moments as this we must think about all contingencies we must think about the future 
about yourselves. I love all of you as though you were my own children. You know that. The princess gazed at him immovably, betraying no sign of her feelings. In a word, it is necessary, also, to think of my family, continued Prince Vasily, testily giving the stand a push. You know, Katish, that you three Mamontov sisters and my wife are the Count's only direct heirs. I know, I know how hard it is for you to speak and think about such things, and it is no easier for me. But, my dear, I am sixty years old. I must be ready for anything. Do you know that I have had to send for Pierre? The Count pointed directly at his portrait, signifying that he wanted to see him. Prince Vasily looked questioningly at the princess, but he could not make out whether she had comprehended what he had said to her or was simply looking at him. "'I do not cease to pray God for him, mon cousin,' she replied, "'that he will pardon him and grant his noble soul a peaceful passage from this—' "'Yes, of course,' hastily interposed Prince Vasily, rubbing his bald forehead and again testily drawing toward him the table that he had just pushed away. "'But—but—' but, to make a long story short, this is what I mean. You yourself know that last winter the Count wrote a will by which all his property was left to Pierre, and all the rest of us were left out in the cold. But think how many wills he has made, replied the princess, calmly. Besides, he can't leave, make Pierre his heir. Pierre is illegitimate. Mon cher, said Prince Vasily, suddenly clutching the table in his excitement, and speaking more rapidly. But supposing a letter has been written to the Emperor, in which the Count begs to have Pierre legitimatized, do you understand that in view of the Count's services his petition would be granted? The Princess smiled that smile of superiority peculiar to people who think they know more about any matter than those with whom they are talking. I will tell you, moreover, pursued Prince Vasily, seizing her by the hand, the letter has been written, but it has not yet been sent, but the Emperor knows about it. The question is merely this. Has it been destroyed or not? If not, then, as soon as all is over, Prince Vasily sighed, giving to understand what he meant to convey by the words, all is over, then the Count's papers will be opened, the will and the letter will be handed to the Emperor, and the petition will be undoubtedly granted. Pierre, as the legitimate son, would inherit all. But our share? demanded the princess, smiling ironically, as though all things except this were possible. But, my poor Katish, it is as clear as day. Then he will be the only legal heir, and will have the whole, and you will simply get nothing. You ought to know, my dear, whether the will and the letter have been written, or whether they have been destroyed. And if they have been forgotten, then you ought to know where they are, and to find them, so that— that's the last feather, interrupted the princess, smiling sardonically and not varying the expression of her eyes. I am a woman, and according to your idea, all of us women are stupid, but I know well enough that an illegitimate son cannot inherit. Un petard, she added, with the intention of showing the prince, by this French term, conclusively how inconsistent he was. Why can't you understand, Katish? You are so clever. Why can't you understand that if the Count has written a letter to the Emperor, begging him to legitimize his son, of course Pierre will not be Pierre any longer, but Count Bouzoukoy, and then he will inherit the whole according to the will. And if the will and letter are not destroyed, then you will get nothing except the consolation of knowing that you were dutiful a tout ce qui s'en suit. That is one sure thing." I know that the will has been made, but I know also that it is not good for anything, and it seems to me that you take me for a perfect fool, mon cousin, said the princess, with that expression that women assume when they think they have said something sharp and insulting. My dear Princess Katerina Semyonovna, impatiently reiterated Prince Vasily, I did not come with the intention of having a controversy with you but to talk with you about your own interests as with a relative, a kind, good, true relative. I tell you for the tenth time that if this letter to the Emperor and the will in Pierre's favor are among the Count's papers, then you, my dear little friend, 
will not inherit anything, nor your sisters either. If you don't believe me, then ask somebody who does know. I have just been talking with Dmitri Onufryitch, that was the Count's lawyer, and he says the same thing. A change evidently came over the Countess's thoughts. Her thin lips grew white, her eyes remained the same, and her voice when she spoke evidently surprised even herself by the violence of its gusty outburst. "'That would be fine,' said she. "'I have never desired anything, and I would not now.' She brushed the dog from her lap and straightened the folds of her dress. "'Here is gratitude. Here is recognition for all the sacrifices that people have made for him,' cried she. "'Excellent. Very fine. I don't need anything, Prince.' "'Yes, but it is not you alone. You have sisters,' replied Prince Vasily. The princess, however, did not heed him. "'Yes, I have known for a long time, but I had not realized it, that I had nothing to expect in this house except baseness, deception, envy, intrigue, except ingratitude, the blackest ingratitude.' "'Do you know, or do you not know, where the will is?' asked Prince Vasily his cheeks twitching even more than before. Yes, I was stupid. I have always had faith in people, and loved them, and sacrificed myself. But those only are successful who are base and low. I know through whose intrigues this came about. The princess wanted to get up, but the prince detained her by the arm. The princess's face suddenly took on the expression of one who has become soured against the whole human race, she looked angrily at her relative. "'There is still time enough. You must know, my dear Katish, that all this may have been done hastily, in a moment of pique, of illness, and then forgotten. Our duty, my dear, is to correct his mistake, to soothe his last moments, so that he cannot in decency commit this injustice. We must not let him die with the idea that he was making unhappy those who—' "'Those who sacrificed everything for him—' interrupted the princess, taking the words out of his mouth. Again she tried to get up, but still the prince would not allow her. And he has never had the sense to perceive it. No, mon cousin, she added with a sigh. I shall yet live to learn that in this world it is idle to expect one's reward, and that in this world there is no such thing as honor or justice. In this world one must be shrewd and wicked. Well, Voyon, calm yourself. I know your good heart. No, I have a heart full of wickedness. I know your heart, repeated the prince. I prize your friendship, and I could wish that you had as high an opinion of me. Now calm yourself, and parlons raison. Now is the golden time, a few hours at most, perhaps a few moments. Now tell me all you know about this will, and above all where it is. You must know. He has probably forgotten all about it, now we must take it and show it to the Count. Probably he has forgotten all about it, and would wish it to be destroyed. You understand that my sole desire is sacredly to carry out his wishes. That is why I came here. I am here only to help him and you. Now I understand all. I know whose intrigues it was. I know, said the Princess. That is not the point, my dear heart. It is your protégé, your dear Princess Drubitskaya, Anna Mikhailovna, whom I would not take for my chambermaid, that filthy, vile woman. Let us not lose time, said the prince, in French. Ah, oh, don't speak to me. Last winter she sneaked in here, and she told the Count such vile things, such foul things about all of us, especially about Sophie. I cannot repeat them. So that the Count was taken ill, and for two weeks would not see any of us. It was at that time, I know, that he wrote that nasty, vile paper, but I suppose that it did not mean anything. That is just the point. Why haven't you told me before? In the mosaic portfolio which he keeps under his pillow. Now I know, again went on the princess. Yes, if I have any sins on my soul, the greatest sin is my hatred of that horrid woman— almost cried the princess, her face all convulsed. And why did she sneak in here? But I will tell her my whole mind, that I will. The time will come. 
End of chapter 19 at the time that these various conversations were going on in the reception room and in the princess's apartment, the carriage with Pierre, who had been sent for, and with Anna Mikhailovna, who found it essential to accompany him, drove into Count Buzikoy's courtyard. When the carriage wheels rolled noiselessly upon the straw scattered under the windows, Anna Mikhailovna turned to her companion with consoling words, but was surprised to find him asleep in the corner of the carriage. She wakened him, and, as he followed her from the carriage, it dawned upon him for the first time that a meeting with his dying father was before him. He noticed that they had drawn up not at the state entrance but at the rear door. Just as he left the carriage, two men in merchant garb skulked down from the doorway and hid in the shadow of the wall. Stopping a moment to look around, he saw several other similar figures on both sides in the shadow but neither Anna Mikhailovna, nor the lackey, nor the coachman, though they could not have helped seeing these men, paid any attention to them. "'Why, of course it must be all right,' said Pierre to himself, and followed Anna Mikhailovna. Anna Mikhailovna, with hurried steps, tripped up the dimly lighted narrow stone stairway, and beckoned to Pierre, who loitered behind her. He could not seem to realize why it was necessary for him to go to the Count, and still less why they had to enter by the rear door, but concluding by Anna Mikhailovna's assurance and haste that it was absolutely necessary, he decided to follow her. Halfway up the stairs they almost ran into some men with buckets, who came clattering down and pressed up close to the wall to let them pass, but showed not the slightest surprise to see them there. "'Is this the way to the princess's apartments?' she inquired of one of them. "'Yes,' replied the lackey, in a loud, insolent voice, as though now anything were permissible. The door at the left, Matushka. Perhaps the Count did not call for me, said Pierre, when they reached the landing. I would better go to my room. Anna Mikhailovna waited till Pierre overtook her. Ah, mon ami, said she, laying her hand on his arm, just as she had done that morning to her son. Believe that I suffer as much as you. But be a man— "'Really, hadn't I better go?' asked Pierre, looking affectionately at Anna Mikhailovna through his spectacles. "'Ah, mon ami,' she said, still in French, "'forget the wrongs that may have been done you. Remember he is your father, perhaps even now dying,' she sighed. "'I have loved you from the very first, like my own son. Trust in me, Pierre. I will not forget your interests.' Pierre did not in the least comprehend— but again with even more force it came over him that all this must necessarily be so and he submissively followed anna mikhailovna who had already opened the door the door led into the entry of the rear apartments in one corner sat an old manservant of the princesses knitting a stocking pierre had never before been in this part of the house he was not even aware of the existence of such rooms Anna Mikhailovna hailed a maid whom she saw hurrying along with a carafe on a tray, and calling her by various familiar terms of endearment, asked how the princesses were, and at the same time beckoned Pierre to follow her along the stone corridor. The first door on the left led into the princess's private rooms. The chambermaid with a carafe, in her haste, everything was done in haste at this time in this mansion, failed to close the door, and as Pierre and Anna Mikhailovna passed by, they involuntarily glanced into the room where sat the oldest of the nieces in close conference with Prince Vasily. Seeing them passing, Prince Vasily made a hasty movement and drew himself up. The princess sprang to her feet, and in her vexation slammed the door to with all her might. This action was so unlike the princess's habitual serenity, the apprehension pictured on the princess's face was so contrary to his ordinary expression of self-importance, that Pierre paused and looked inquiringly at his guide through his spectacles. Anna Mikhailovna manifested no surprise. She merely smiled slightly and sighed, as though to signify that all this was to be expected. Soyons, mon ami. I will watch over your interests, said she, in answer to his glance, and tripped along the corridor even more hastily than before. Pierre did not comprehend what the trouble was, and still less her words, watch over your interests, but he came to the conclusion that all this must be so. 
they went from the corridor into a dimly lighted hall which adjoined the count's reception room it was one of those cold and magnificent apartments in the front of the house which pierre knew so well but even in this room right in the middle stood a forgotten bathtub from which the water was leaking into the carpet a servant and a clergyman carrying a censer came toward them on their tiptoes but paid no attention to them then they entered the reception room with its two italian windows its door leading into the winter garden and adorned with a colossal bust and full-length portrait of the empress catherine the room was filled with the same people in almost the same attitudes sitting and whispering together they all stopped talking and stared at anna mikhailovna as she entered with her pale tear-stained face followed by the stout burly pierre submissively hanging his head anna mikhailovna's face expressed the consciousness that a decisive moment was at hand and with the bearing of a genuine petersburg woman of affairs she marched into the room not allowing pierre to leave her and showing even more boldness than in the morning she knew that as she was bringing the person whom the dying count desired to see her reception was assured with a quick glance she surveyed all who were in the room and perceiving the count's priest she without exactly bowing but suddenly diminishing her stature sailed with a mincing gait up to the confessor and respectfully received the blessing first of one and then of the other priest thank god we are in time said she to the priest we are his relatives and were so much alarmed lest we should be too late this young man here is the count's son she added in a lower tone a terrible moment after speaking these words she went over to the doctor cher docteur she said to him ce jeune homme est la face du comte il était de l'espoir is there any hope the doctor silently with a quick movement shrugged his shoulders and cast his eyes upward anna mikhailovna exactly imitating him also raised hers almost closing them and drew a deep sigh then she turned from the doctor to pierre her manner was respectful and affectionate with a shade of sadness have confidence in his mercy said she in french pointing him to a small sofa where he should sit and wait for her while she noiselessly directed her steps toward the door which was the attraction for all eyes and noiselessly opening it disappeared from sight pierre making up his mind in all things to obey his guide went to the little sofa which she pointed out to him as soon as anna mikhailovna was out of sight he noticed that the eyes of all who were in the room were fastened upon him with more curiosity than sympathy he noticed that all were whispering together nodding toward him with a sort of aversion and even servility he was shown a degree of respect which he had never been shown before a lady whom he did not know the one who had been talking with the two priests got up from her place and motioned to him to sit down the adjutant picked up a glove which he had dropped and gave it to him the doctors preserved a respectful silence as he passed by them and fell back to make way for him at first pierre was inclined to sit down in another place so as not to disturb the lady was inclined to pick up his own glove and to turn out for the doctors though they were not at all in his way but on second thought it suddenly occurred to him that this would not be becoming he felt that this night he was a person expected to fulfil some terrible and obligatory ceremony and therefore he was in duty bound to accept the services of all these people he silently received the glove from the adjutant and took the lady's place laying his huge hands on his evenly plated knees in the naive poise of an egyptian statue and saying to himself that all this was just as it was meant to be and that lest he should lose his presence of mind and commit some absurdity it behooved him this evening above all to give up all idea of self-guidance but commit himself wholly to the will of those who assumed the direction of him not two minutes had passed when prince vasili in his kaftan with three stars on his breast carrying his head majestically came into the room he seemed thinner than when pierre had last seen him his eyes opened larger than usual when he glanced about the room and caught sight of pierre he went straight up to him took his hand a thing which he had never done before and bent it down as though trying by experiment whether it had any power of resistance courage courage mon ami he has asked to see you that is good and he started to go away but pierre felt that it was suitable to ask how is he 
he stammered, not knowing exactly how to call the dying Count. He was ashamed to call him father. He had another stroke half an hour ago. Courage, mon ami. Pierre was in such a dazed condition of mind that at the word coupe he imagined that someone had hit him. He looked at Prince Vasily in perplexity, and it was only after some time that he was able to gather that coupe meant an attack of apoplexy. Prince Vasily, as he went by, said a few words to Lorraine and went into the bedroom on his tiptoes. He was not used to walking on his tiptoes, and his whole body jumped as he walked. He was immediately followed by the oldest princess. Then came the confessor and priests. Some of the house servants also joined in the procession and passed into the sleeping room. There was heard some stir, and finally Anna Mikhailovna, with the same pale countenance, firmly bent on the fulfillment of her duties, came running out and touching Pierre on the arm said, The goodness of God is inexhaustible. The ceremony is about to begin. Come. Pierre passed into the room, treading on the soft carpet, and noticed that the adjutant and the strange lady and one of the servants all followed him, as though now it were no longer necessary to ask permission to go in. End of chapter 20"'Pierre well knew this great room, divided by columns and an arcade, and all hung with Persian tapestries. The part of the chamber behind the columns, where on one side stood a huge mahogany bedstead with silken curtains, and on the other a monstrous kyot, or shrine with images, was all brightly and beautifully lighted, just as churches are usually lighted for evening service. Under the glittering decorations of this shrine stood a long Voltaire reclining chair, and in the chair— supported by snowy white unruffled cushions apparently only just changing lay the majestic form of pierre's father count buzikoy with his hair heaped up on his lofty forehead like a lion's mane as pierre remembered it so well and the same strong deep wrinkles on his handsome aristocratic face reddish yellow in color he was wrapped to the waist in a bright green quilt and lay directly under the holy pictures both of his great stout arms were uncovered and lay on the quilt. In his right hand, which lay palm down, a wax taper was placed between the thumb and forefinger, and an old servant bending over the chair held it upright. Around the chair stood the clergy in their magnificent glittering robes, with their long locks streaming down over their shoulders, with lighted tapers in their hands, performing their functions with slow solemnity. A little back from them stood the two younger princesses, with handkerchiefs in their hands, pressed to their eyes, and just in front of them was the oldest sister, Katish, with a spiteful, resolute face, not for a moment letting her eyes wander from the icon, as though she were saying to all that she would not be responsible for her actions if she looked around. Anna Mikhailovna, with an expression of sanctified grief and universal forgiveness on her face, stood near the door with the strange lady. Prince Vasily, on the other side of the door, near the Count, stood behind a carved chair, upholstered in velvet, which he had turned back to, and was leaning on it his left hand with a taper, and crossing himself with his right hand, raising his eyes each time that his fingers touched his forehead. His face expressed calm devoutness and submission to the will of God. "'If you cannot comprehend these feelings, so much the worse for you,' his countenance seemed to say. Behind him stood the adjutant, the doctors, and the men-servants, just as in church the men and women took opposite sides. No one spoke. All kept crossing themselves. The only sound was the reading of the service, the low, subdued chanting of the priest's deep bass, and during the intervals of silence the restless movement of feet and deep sighs. Anna Mikhailovna, with that significant expression of countenance that showed she knew what she was doing, crossed the whole width of the chamber to where Pierre was, and gave him a taper. He lighted it, and then, growing confused under the glances of those around him, began to cross himself with the hand which held the taper. The youngest of the sisters, the rosy and fun-loving Princess Sophie, the one with the mole, was looking at him. She smiled and hid her face in her handkerchief, and did not expose it for some time, when she caught sight of Pierre again, her amusement again overcame her. Then, evidently feeling that she had not the self-control sufficient to allow her to look at him without smiling, 
and that she could not keep from looking at him, she quietly fled from temptation by retreating behind a column. In the midst of the service, the voices of the clergy suddenly ceased. The priest whispered something to each other. The old waiting man, who held the candle in the Count's hand, straightened up and went over to the lady's side. Anna Mikhailovna stepped forward, and bending over the sick man, beckoned to Dr. Lorraine without turning around. The French doctor had been standing without a lighted taper, leaning against one of the pillars, in that reverent attitude by which one who, though a stranger and belonging to a different creed, shows that he appreciates all the solemnity of the ceremony and even assents to it. With the noiseless steps of a man possessed of perfect vigor, he answered Anna Mikhailovna's call, went over to the sick man, lifted in his white, slender fingers the hand that lay on the green quilt, and bending over, began to count the pulse and grew grave. Something was given to the invalid to drink. There was a slight stir about him. Then once more they all took their places, and the service proceeded. At the time of this interruption, Pierre noticed that Prince Vasily left his position behind the carved chair, and, with an expression of countenance that seemed to say that he knew what he was doing, and that it was so much worse for others if they did not understand him, went, not to the sick man, but past him, and being joined by the oldest of the princesses, retired with her into the depths of the alcove, to the high bedstead under the silken hangings. From there both the prince and the princess disappeared through a rear door, but before the end of the service both resumed their places, one after the other. Pierre gave this strange action no more thought than to anything else, having once for all made up his mind that all that took place that evening was absolutely essential. The sounds of the church chant ceased, and the voice of the priest was heard respectfully congratulating the sick man on his having received the mystery. The count lay as before, motionless and as though lifeless. Around him was a stir, footsteps and a whispering were heard. Anna Mikhailovna's voice could be distinguished above the rest. Pierre listened and heard her say, he must be carried instantly to bed. It will never do in the world for him here to— The doctors, princesses, and servants crowded around the invalid so that Pierre could no longer see that reddish-yellow face with the gray mane of hair, which ever since the service began had constantly filled his vision to the exclusion of everything else. He surmised by the guarded movements of those who crowded around the armchair that they were lifting and carrying the dying man. Hold by my arm— "'You'll drop him so,' said one of the servants in a frightened whisper. "'Take him lower down. One more,' said different voices, and the laboured breathing and shuffling of feet growing more hurried seemed to indicate that the load that these men were carrying was beyond their strength. As the bearers, among their number Anna Mikhailovna, came opposite the young man, he caught a momentary glimpse over their heads and backs of his father's strong, full chest uncovered, his stout shoulders lifted above the people carrying him under their arms, and his leonine head with its curly mane. The face, with its extraordinary high forehead and cheekbones, handsome, sensitive mouth, and majestic, cold eyes, was undisfigured by the nearness of death. It was just the same as when Pierre had seen it three months previously, when the Count had sent him to Petersburg. But the head rolled helplessly under the uneven steps of the bearers, and the cold, indifferent eyes gave no sign of recognition. There followed a few moments of bustle around the high bedstead. Those who had been carrying the sick man withdrew. Anna Mikhailovna touched Pierre on the arm and said, Vini. Pierre went with her to the bed, whereon the sick man had been placed in solemn attitude, evidently in some manner connected with the sacrament just accomplished. He lay with his head propped high on pillows, his hands were placed side by side, palm downward, on the green silk quilt. As Pierre went to him, the Count was looking straight at him, but his look had that meaning and significance which it is impossible for a man to read. Either that look had simply nothing to say, and merely fastened upon him because those eyes must needs look at something, or they had too much to say. Pierre paused, not knowing what was expected of him, and glanced inquiringly at his guide. Anna Mikhailovna made him a hasty motion with her eyes toward the sick man's hand, and with her lips signified that he should kiss it. Pierre bent over carefully so as not to disturb the quilt, and in accordance with her advice touched his lips to the broad, brawny hand. 
neither the hand nor a muscle of the count's face moved pierre again looked questioningly at anna mikhailovna to find what he should do next she signed to him with her eyes to sit down in an armchair which stood near the bed pierre submissively sat down his eyes mutely asking if he were doing the right thing anna mikhailovna approvingly nodded her head pierre again assumed the symmetrically simple attitude of the egyptian statue and evidently really suffered because his awkward huge frame took up so much space though he strove with all his might to make it seem as small as possible he looked at the count the count was staring at the spot where pierre had just been standing anna mikhailovna showed by her actions that she realized the pathetic importance of this final meeting of father and son this lasted two minutes which seemed an hour to pierre suddenly a tremor appeared in the deep powerful muscles and lines of the count's face it grew more pronounced the handsome mouth was drawn to one side this caused pierre for the first time to realize how near to death his father was and from the drawn mouth proceeded an indistinguishable hoarse sound anna mikhailovna looked anxiously into the sick man's eyes and tried to make out what he wanted pointing first at pierre then at the tumbler then she asked in a whisper if she should call prince vasily then pointed at the quilt the sick man's face and eyes expressed impatience he mustered force enough to look at the manservant who never left his master's bedside he wants to be turned over on the other side whispered the servant and proceeded to lift and turn the count's heavy body face to the wall pierre got up to help the servant just as they were turning the count over one of his arms fell back helplessly and he made a futile effort to raise it did the count notice the look of terror on pierre's face at the sight of that lifeless arm or did some other thought flash across his dying brain at that moment at all events he looked at his disobedient hand then at pierre's terror-stricken face and back to his hand again and over his lips played a martyr's weak smile out of character with his powerful features and seeming to express a feeling of scorn for his own lack of strength at the sight of this smile pierre unexpectedly felt an oppression around the heart a strange pinching in his nose and the tears dimmed his eyes the sick man lay on his side toward the wall he drew a long sigh he is going to sleep said anna mikhailovna to one of the nieces who returned to watch allons pierre left the room End of chapter 21